we found our, our way into a, a secret little hideout here in the Paradox Castle. Uh, I'm not quite sure what it was used for in the past, but it may have been uh, uh, a room for maybe the uh, Lord's mistress or something like that. Sexual or, favors. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really cozy and, and nice and warm. And there's a little fireplace over there. But we're sitting down here with Shams, who's, who's really here, but he's just keeping secrets from us. Because the games you're working on now, they aren't really on, on display here. Uh, no, that's right. Um, uh, what I do at Paradox basically is just make sign the games that we'll announce in like a year from now. So that's basically what I do. I think we have uh, 25 games in production right now. Half of them are on new IPs, half are established IPs. And most of them are being announced during this year. I announced a couple of games now. We'll announce more at GDC. Yeah. Um, a lot of these projects are being made with uh, Arrowhead. Um, they're so talented and make so fantastic game designers. So we're just giving them the chance to just start a bunch of new IPs. So we're doing four, four projects on four different IPs with Arrowhead. So they've gone far, this, the small team that made our Magica. Mm. And um, speaking of that and, and how you work with small teams, it seems like there's, there's always been this global approach from Paradox. You've looked for, for developers everywhere, but a lot of more uh, focus on, on Swedish small developers, it seems, now. And uh, is that true? It's absolutely true. Um, um, I think the the Swedish game industry has shown uh, very clearly thus far that S Swedes are really good at making games. And I think there are 1,200 people in the gaming industry in Sweden right now and 800 s gaming students graduate every year. So the numbers make no sense whatsoever. So, uh, And at the same time, entrepreneurship and starting a company in Sweden is pretty hard. And um, so for a long time, I mean, we we've been working with so many developers that are making their game for the first time they're making the taking their first steps and we've we noticed that hey all we do is work with new teams why not formalize this and start a incubator and give the game developers of sweden a chance to like come to a place where there's a creative environment where they can get office space hardware software producers and marketers and other developers and qa resources and sit there in peace and quiet and just make a great game for about six months because the the innovation that exists in this in industry comes from indie developers it's not the big triple a studios that that's not their specialty what they're really good at is polishing some features and making it really good mm -hmm. and i think i mentioned this earlier that um the batman new batman games are so good they with the their base exploration mechanic in the game is derived from the Zelda series. You can't get past that stone because you're not strong enough to lift it. Mm. And they use the same things, it's the same formula, but it's in a super tight leather package that is Batman. So, um, so, but it's not innovative in that sense. So we see innovation coming from the smaller developers mm. and that's why we're focusing a lot on Swedish developers that, uh, um, that are trying to do cool PC games that would, would fit in the Paradox portfolio. And 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 you're also faced with uh, on the on the flip side of this, you're faced with a, with a problem that's sort of a, a good problem to have. Uh, now you got a hit franchise, Magica, and and sort of how do you treat that? And and you know because you know a, a lot of a lot of times you go straight for a sequel and you you want to cash in on, on yeah. something that's very successful, but you know and it's it's a little bit of an uh, unknown territory for you guys in terms of, of this has a mass appeal this is it has a big casual audience yeah. as well as it's not it's not a niche title and 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 the, of course if you if you were to announce Magica 2 th you know then then there would be a lot of expectations uh, it, you know it w would it be a normal thing to announce it here have it come out in a year that would be the yeah. normal thing for the games industry uh yeah you, you're completely right and um I think that um, we have a very clear plan for what we want to do with Magicka. It's it, it's our most important franchise. It's the one that's sold the best, and we'll definitely have stuff planned for it. But I was I was I think I was the first to uh, raise my hand internally at Paradox and say, you know what, we should Arrowhead should not make Magicka two or three right now. They need to recharge their batteries. They need to make make a couple of other games, and then we come back to Magicka once we got. Uh, a bunch of experience and got all those juices flowing, the creative juices, and then we'll do a really good sequel um, that will surprise people and just amaze people. So, 
um, the expectations are high, but what we're doing is that we're finding more developers that can help with the existing Magicka and give them what they want. A lot of players ask for more uh, campaign content. We added that. They added for different options when it came to single player. We added that. So it's all about listening to the community and giving them stuff they want and at the same time um, fixing uh, the improving the engine and game as much as possible and keeping people interested but it's uh but it's um the the, the the approach we like is that and this is my problem with or problem why i won't do a triple a game even if we could or wanted to uh, is that it takes so long to make them that you have to sit down and try to guess okay what do we think that people would want from magica if it was a three-year project and we have to design those things and start making them and then we release the game and we have to hope that okay magica those features we thought people liked say an open world exploration whatever mm. it did that work whoops it maybe did it maybe didn't so i'd much rather release games that are more modular in the sense that it's a, it's a smaller base product but then if people want more pvp we just add more pvp if people want an open world we'd add an open world so um uh, somebody once asked me if i if i gave you 20 million to make one game what game would that be and i say i would never make one game for 20 million i make 20 games for a million a piece 10 of them would fail five would do okay five would do slightly four would do slightly better and the last one would probably be a huge hit and i'll give that game another million and then another million and over the course of the years i'll spend 20 million on that game but uh but i'll do it incrementally and i'll listen to community but then again i don't have 20 million so <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Soon. <laughs> so uh, it's interesting, and I, I feel like you're you're trying that approach, the whole uh, magic approach, to a few other titles. You switched over uh, Gettysburg from a free-to-play model to mm -hmm. something that's similar to Magic. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that something that we'll see more of for for future projects as well? Absolutely. I think that um, all the games that we're announcing at GDC will follow this this model of starting somewhat with a more focused gameplay experience and leaving a lot of doors open and listening to the gamers and then moving on from that point. And uh, I think that all the games that I look on that we sign, we always want it to have at least a potential of super greatness. It doesn't have to start there, but it's a, it's a long journey and it's a journey that we make together with the developer so whenever we sign games and i look at games like for instance with the with zeal that are making a game of dwarves we have two games in, pr in production with them the we actually started talking about the other game first that that was the initial game and they showed me the one line pitch from the game and it's they compared it it's like this game and that game in this package and i was like perfect let's do this and then we didn't talk at all more about the game during the entire negotiation, we never talked about what what would be in the games or units and stuff. What we talked about instead was, so what's Zeal's um, uh, goal for the next three, four years? What what makes them tick? What kind of games do they like? What they, don't they like? What kind of company are they building? Do they want to move to Stockholm? That, those kind of motivations and questions. And see... Is this something, is this a growth that we can do together? Can we be, as we say in Sweden, s sit on the same side of the table and move in the same direction and face the same direction? Because a lot of times people come to publishers or developers come to publishers without knowing exactly what they want. Sometimes people are only looking for money. Sometimes people are only looking for a marketing support or just can you get us on Steam? And what we, we only work with people who want to be partners with us. We have a lot of strengths, a lot of weaknesses. And developers have a lot of strengths and weaknesses as well. So we need to mesh and make sure that we match against each other and work well. So that's how we're going to um, go forwards in the future with the games and have that modular approach and um, try to make, make really fun and innovative games. I, I need to congratulate you as well because you were on that... Uh young achievers list list and develop um and I, I was shocked to find you were under 30 first of all <laughs> um but um um i, I don't know uh, what what these kind of things mean to, to anyone i mean obviously making a great game is, is much more of an achievement but um mm. um what what do you feel is is the role of, of your role as a producer with a publisher uh, and sort of where do you see that role because Typically, it's it's the man, man with money mm. who who tells people what to focus on, mm. and perhaps you know 
isn't necessarily seen regarded that highly within the industry but yeah. what how would you like to that role to to be like and and, and how do you approach it uh yeah so i think that the um, producer's role going forwards especially when we're in the middle class of gaming where paradox is uh, is that we have to we have to successfully merge uh, the new standards that appear for games i mean there are conventions for how to handle uh, different stuff in games and we have to um, marry that with um, gameplay that's new uh, new in the sense that it does old old things in a new way so a lot of people uh, i think are chain chasing innovation a bit too much and um, i think it's you don't need to reinvent invent the wheel all the time and when you're talking to developers as a producer you have to help them focus on the right stuff what part of your game will inno innovate and what part won't on which part is okay if you don't innovate mm -hmm. so um like we get still people are talking about now oh, making a world of warcraft k killer as if that was a goal in itself and uh, it's more important m about making a game that's fun and sells well rather than and that's and that thing and i think that's where the producer comes in that has an uh, more outside perspective since developers are so in love with their projects often you can tell them you know what this is great but maybe we should focus on this instead and move do that later mm. and we're looking forward to seeing your next project announced perhaps at gdc definitely <laughs>